Well, ironically, the Fed was founded to try to prevent financial crises. But in the post-war period, what it does is it causes our financial crises. So the Fed was created after a financial crisis in 1907. And the Fed's purpose was the lender of last resort. Much later, this notion that the central bank could control the money supply was developed. And then finally, it morphed into this belief that somehow, magically, the Fed could control inflation. We don't really know how the Fed would be able to control the money supply or why control of the money supply would somehow prevent inflation. But we finally evolved into this view that the Fed controls inflation by getting you to expect that there will be no inflation. So it's come down to nothing but fairy dust. This is the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Hi, I'm Christian Riley, and welcome to the Modern Monetary Theory Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at MMT Podcast, and you can support the show by going to patreon.com slash MMT Podcast. If this is your first time hearing about MMT, you might want to listen to our first three episodes for an introduction, which I've linked to in the show notes, along with some other things that relate to this particular episode. And as ever, I've linked to where you can support this podcast financially via patreon.com slash MMT podcast. Support starts at a dollar a month or a pound a month or whatever the equivalent is wherever you live. We're 100% listener funded. Your financial support really helps keep the show going and your support in other ways, whether it's by recommending us to other people or just by listening and spreading the word about this stuff really helps too. A big thank you to all of our supporters so far and thanks as ever for the time you put into understanding MMT. Let's dive in. Welcome one and all to the MMT podcast. I'm Christian Riley, And I'm Patricia Pina. And we are delighted to welcome back to the show primary MMT academic and author of many works, including Why Minsky Matters. And I'm sure we'll be talking about why indeed Minsky continues to matter in 2023. So it's our pleasure to welcome back Professor L. Randall Ray. Hi, Randy. Hi, good to be back. As we record this, you have two recently published articles out about the recent bank collapses and the extent of the Fed's culpability in those collapses. And in one of those articles, which you wrote with Professor Stephanie Kelton, you write that the Silicon Valley bank collapse was a case of history repeated. Would you mind walking us through that history? Okay. Well, if you go back to the 1950s, the Fed got its independence from the Treasury in 1951. During World War II, the Fed had sort of been put under the Treasury, and its job was to keep interest rates low so that the government wouldn't spend a lot on interest on the bonds that it was issuing during World War II, which, of course, is also a very interesting topic. But the Fed started raising rates gradually during the 50s, And it began to take on an ever bigger role for macroeconomic management, sort of management of the economy. The first really big rate hike was in 1966, and it led to a financial crisis, our first financial crisis of the post-war period. And those crises become more and more frequent and more and more severe as we move up to the present day. If you look at every one of our recessions since 1958, the Fed has been raising interest rates going into the recession. And many of these also had financial crises. So the Fed began sharply raising interest rates over the past year. The interest rate went up by 400 basis points, which is 4% in one year, and that has led to tremendous problems in the banks. In the article you wrote for The Hill with Yevon Asisian called The Collapse of SVB Shows Why Monetary Policy is the Wrong Tool to Fight Inflation, you mentioned that, in fact, the Fed 
wasn't even established to control inflation. Some people might be amazed to hear that. Tell us about that. Well, ironically, the Fed was founded to try to prevent financial crises. But in the post-war period, what it does is it causes our financial crises. So yeah, it is very ironic. So the Fed was created after a financial crisis in 1907. We did not have a central bank, so we were nothing like Britain, which had a central bank since the 17th century. We created the central bank because that 1907 crisis had to be resolved by the private banks themselves. And they did. J.P. Morgan stepped up. And the story goes that he got, got all the biggest bankers in a room, locked the door and said, you are not leaving this room until you all commit funds to save the financial system. And so they saved it. But they didn't want to do that again. So they pushed Congress, really against its will, screaming the whole time to found the Fed. And the Fed's purpose was to make sure that the next time a financial crisis rose up, the Fed would be there and it could be the lender of last resort, which was a principle of central banking that by that time was more than half a century old. And that, that really is why the Fed was created. Only gradually did the Fed come to play the role that other central banks had played for a long time, which is to be the banker for the Treasury. And so that was its second role, to make and receive all payments for the Treasury and to help the Treasury place bonds into the economy. Much later, this notion that the central bank could control the money supply was developed. And so then gradually over time, this sort of became the role of the central bank to try to control the money supply so that private banks wouldn't create too much of it and lead to too much lending, possibly too much spending, and also possibly building up too much risk. So controlling the money supply. And then finally, it morphed into this belief that somehow, magically, the Fed could control inflation. And so we, we had that magical thinking, and that's in the title of the paper with Stephanie for a reason. We had that magical thinking. We don't really know how the Fed would be able to control the money supply. Or why control of the money supply would somehow prevent inflation? That was magical thinking. But we finally evolved into this view that the Fed controls inflation by getting you to expect that there will be no inflation. So it's come down to nothing but fairy dust. That's all it is. We will act in a way that gets you to believe there will be no inflation and then magically there will be no inflation. To me, it's puzzling is that that requires people to believe that the Fed has other mechanisms for controlling inflation. Right. And it has none. <laughs> it has nothing but the fairy dust. And so it works when it's working and it doesn't work when people won't get in line. So what was very interesting is, so we have the global financial crisis and we moved into this new, very low inflation environment. In fact, even deflation in some countries, deflation in some of the euro area, deflation in Japan. In the United States, we had a uh, 1% inflation. And so the problem for central banks was that that was too low. They, for some, again, magical thinking, 2% is the magical number. Powell was asked about this in, in Congress. And he just said, well, this is what central banks do. You know, it's 2%. There is no justification for this whatsoever. But anyway, 2% is the magical number. And the actual inflation rate was below this. Okay. So they've got to get it up. How are they going to get it up? Well, magical thinking. We're, first, they went to zero interest rate policy. Okay. That should lower interest rates. But why would that increase inflation? Well, it never did. And since inflation wasn't going up, then they moved on to quantitative easing which meant that they would put trillions and trillions of dollars, euros, yen into the banking system. Somehow, magically, that would cause inflation to appear. It never did. Let's just jump in and say it was injecting reserves into the banking system, into the payment system, 
right? And I think at a very basic level, a lot of people were told the governments around the world are printing money, central banks around the world are printing money and missing out the key detail that banks don't lend reserves to their retail customers. That's right. The reserves are all locked up at the Fed, actually. They're not even in the banks. Yeah, They're locked yeah. up at the Fed. It's just the bank's checking account. Very often when QE is questioned, people say, okay, let's follow the money. Where did that money go? But from what you're saying is the money went nowhere. <laughs> it's just stuck <laughs> it's not a bank. mystery as well, you know, because money is accounting. You can see where it went. It sat there, right? Yeah. All that the central banks did was they debited the bank's savings account, which is treasury bonds, and credited the bank's checking account, which is reserves. Reserves are only used for banks to clear payments. That's all they're used for. So banks can clear payments with each other. They can also clear payments to, uh, for you with the treasury when you pay your taxes. But that's all they're used for. Banks do not lend them. They're not the basis of lending in any way whatsoever. So they don't encourage banks to lend. They don't encourage anybody to spend. They have no impact on the economy. But it did pose a bit of a problem because when the central bank's balance sheets just exploded because of this, they go to trillions and trillions of dollars. They are holding the government bonds and there weren't enough of those. So they bought mortgage-backed securities too. So the central banks are holding all of these assets. Why weren't there enough of those bonds was it the case that the central banks are buying bonds in the secondary market and they're still not getting inflation up? So they're targeting by price, not quantity, right? And so they're like, well, we need to find another way to put more reserves into the system. And mortgage-backed securities was the next thing they went to. Am I way off base there? I think there also, it was an attempt to prop up the mortgage-backed securities market. It could be they were overpaying for mortgage-backed securities whose value had fallen. And this was a way to protect the banks, although I don't think they will say this in public. And we don't really know how many of those mortgage-backed securities were really trashy assets. It's possible that some of that also explains why they were buying them. I'm not sure. But anyway, so then it was funny because they say, well, our balance sheets are so huge, and this is very unusual. Central banks are not normally these humongous financial institutions. We should try to sell them back. And every time they tried to sell them back, the markets crashed, and the interest rates went up. So that was a strange thing. But yeah, they never were able to get inflation up, no matter what they did. And they couldn't get expectations up either. Okay, so this is a problem for their theory, because... Why on earth wouldn't the markets expect in inflation when the central banks are telling you they're doing this to cause inflation? The markets simply did not believe it. They did not believe the central banks could cause inflation. So they actually can't even influence the expectations. So that is a weak link in their story. Then just skip forward when we got the COVID pandemic actual inflation started increasing. Now, it had nothing to do with too much demand or Larry Summers' arguments. It was mostly supply-side inflation. And if you watch the expectations, they did not rise nearly as much as actual inflation did, which meant the markets also thought, this is not too much demand. This inflation is going to go away. And the Fed kept telling them that too for quite a while. And I praise the Fed for doing that, because that was the right thing to do, to just say, look, it's transitory inflation. We don't need to do anything. It will gradually come down as the supply chains and everything else gets back into place. It took longer than I thought it would, but I still think that it would have done that on its own. But anyway, when you watch the expectations, they remain very low. And so the Fed is supposed to be operating on the basis of expectations, but the expectations told us inflation is going to be low. So there was no need for the Fed to raise interest rates to try to get expectations down because expectations were down. You just spoke about things that the Fed doesn't 
typically talk about. And I remember recently seeing Elizabeth Warren's question in Jerome Powell on the whole notion of using monetary policy. And I felt that was quite an important conversation because despite the fact that we have criticisms as to whether monetary policy is effective or not, But the fact is that at the moment is based on the notion of creating unemployment and generating a recession effectively. And she mentioned something that she questioned Jerome Powell on the fact that every time that the Fed has increased rates in this way, it has always resulted in recession. What do you attribute that recession to? Is this the financial instability that was generated in every case? Or is this the demand that monetary policy is working as intended? I think that most of those recessions were already baked in. They already were going to happen. And it is not the monetary policy that was pushing us to recession. It was the fiscal balance. So what happens when we have a long period of growth is that the... Now, I'm talking about the United States, okay? I don't know that I can generalize this to other countries because I haven't studied them. In the United States, what happens over the course of an expansion, is tax revenue starts to grow very fast. The federal government is pulling income out of the economy. The budget starts to move toward a surplus. And of course, that is what happened in the Clinton expansion. It went into a surplus. Usually, it doesn't get into a surplus. But we were moving toward a budget surplus before the Fed started raising rates. And so watching that, I was already thinking a recession could well be on the way because that's what usually pushes us into a recession. And then what happens is the Fed has been sitting there watching an expansion go on for several years. They've watched the unemployment rate go down. And so their normal reaction is to raise rates as we move into a recession. And I think that explains the correlation between interest rates and recession very well. So it's not really the monetary policy that pushed us into recession. It was the tightening of the fiscal stance that moves us toward recession. And the Fed, with just almost perfect foresight, (laughs) raises rates going into a recession. And then they start reducing rates after the recession hits. That's the typical pattern. Now, if the Fed also manages to produce problems in the financial system, then we also get a financial crisis. A recession plus financial crisis is what gives us the really deep recessions. So when we get both of those things, the recession because of the fiscal stance and then the financial crisis because of the rate hikes, then we get, in the worst case scenario, global financial crisis. While we're on this topic, I'm reminded you also wrote in the recently published MMT Key Insights Leading Thinkers book that contrary to popular opinion, when it comes to government spending, central banks cannot and do not take away the punch bowl. Could you unpack that a little bit? Okay. Well, there's this belief that our elected representatives... So Congress, in the case of the U.S., they're always focused on getting reelected. And so what they want to do is to pump up the economy before elections. And so they increase spending and maybe give tax cuts. And that causes the economy to be overheated. And they're willing to make that trade off because they get reelected. So that's the political business cycle theory that is commonly believed. Actually doing this dastardly tactic of trying to content the people (laughs) in an effort to get re-elected. What, you mean politics? (laughs) Right. So letting people get jobs, and it's the central bank's job to prevent that from happening. (laughs) So the central (laughs) bank takes away the punch bowl and prevents them from doing that. And that's come to be believed as an essential central bank function. Now, Central banks can raise interest rates. So I think it's our mistake that we allow them to set the interest rates. I think that should be taken away from central banks. I would prefer a mandated permanent interest rate. So this is the opposite of Friedman's uh, rule. Instead of money supply growth, I would have the interest rate set permanently at some very low rate. Sort of like Friedman, I don't care that much 
Does it have to be zero? Does it have to be one? Could it be two? I don't think that is the critical question, isn't the number. But setting the interest rate and then the central bank's responsibility is to make sure that they stabilize that rate at whatever Congress has set it to be. That is what central banks ought to be doing. And don't give them dis- the discretion to raise rates. But many people think that somehow the central bank can prevent the government from deficit spending. That is what I'm saying. They don't have that power. And Congress doesn't have the power either. So we, we have crazy politicians who want to have a constitutional amendment to require a balanced budget. This cannot be done. The budgetary outcome is not determined in the spending and taxing bills. It is an ex post outcome. It depends on the economic performance. So when the economy does well, the deficit ex post is going to be lower. When the economy does poorly, ex post is going to be higher. You can't legislate it. It is not discretionary. But the point is, the central bank has to clear the checks. They make the payments for the treasury. Once Congress has allocated the funding that allows the treasury to spend, there is no mechanism, there is no part of the process of government spending that allows the central bank to not allow the treasury to spend, that is, make payments for the treasury. And they have to do it. Last week, I believe, we asked Warren Mosler this question, and I'm interested in your perspective. We take for granted that inflation is a bad thing, and we've decided on this arbitrary figure of 2% that we're going to target. Can you maybe give us your version of why is inflation bad or how much inflation would be acceptable in your view? So inflation, because we're talking about the prices at the level of the economy as a whole, So we've got millions upon millions of goods and services that are sold. And each one of those has a price. We've got to come up with some kind of an index to give us an overall price level. Every price index is a human construction. There's nothing natural about it at all. We decide how we're going to measure it. And the decisions that we make have a huge impact on that price level and the way that the price level moves through time, which is what inflation is, okay? But we can come up with any number of different ways to measure it, and all of them are going to give us different numbers. I would say that when inflation is at a low rate, most people say even at 2%, I would say maybe even at 4 or 5%, we cannot be sure that prices are actually going up because there are so many idiosyncratic things about the indexes that we're using. There's a measurement error. Yeah, and 20 years ago, Papa Demetrio and I wrote about this for Levy Institute Publications, going deeply into the indexes that are used and how bizarre a lot of the components of the index are. So at low rates, you cannot be sure whether prices are actually going up or going down. Now, what people claim is that inflation right now, it's really hard on low-income workers, on low-wage workers. Well, hold it. What is the problem there? Is the problem that their wages are low or is the problem that prices are going up? I think the problem is that their wages are too low. That's why they are struggling. And we should be raising wages. And I think that when we had supply chain disruptions that affected particular components of the consumer basket, so for a while it was oil and heating and so on, and in Europe maybe that's a problem right now, then subsidies are always possible. We did that with some of the pandemic relief. We can provide subsidies and we can target it to lower income people. They got to fill their car to get to work. Let's give them a subsidy so that they can afford to fill their car, food and so on. Right now in the United States, it is rent because we didn't build any houses for since the global financial crisis. We have a severe housing shortage. What do we need to do? Well, we need to subsidize rents, but more important, we need to build as quickly as we possibly can to relieve the shortage. Meantime, we need to subsidize rents so that people don't get kicked out of the units that they have right now. 
So I think that that's the answer. It's not, let's don't raise the unemployment rate because low wage workers are having trouble paying their bills. That makes no sense at all. Some people might see that subsidy of rent as benefiting the rentiers effectively. The housing problem is always framed as a, an issue of lack of supply, but is also an excessive demand issue. Are we too liberal in the way that we allow, say, people to accumulate property? In the United States, we do have a problem that the rental units have been bought up. And yes, there is a big problem of, I guess, private equity that bought up rental units and with monopoly power, they're able to charge whatever they want. And so they are raising. For a while, we had rent control with the part of the pandemic relief, and we need to do something about that too. But again, that's completely different from trying to cause unemployment to bring down inflation, which just means we'll have more people sleep on the streets as our solution to the inflation problem. That's not a reasonable approach. Yes, tackling the rent gouging and providing subsidies, I think, is what we need to do. So back to the banking crisis, let's call it that. In the piece you wrote with Yeva and the one you wrote with Stephanie, you go through historical examples of where the Fed kind of hikes until it breaks something. And one of those breakages was the savings and loan industry in the US. And I was looking it up for any Brits listening, a savings and loan association or a thrift institution is similar to what we would call a building society here in the UK. Randy, can you just tell us what differentiates an SNL from other similar financial institutions? Okay. Did we mention Jimmy Stewart's movie last time? I think we may have done right. So, so yeah. you know, that is showing you what they were like. So we had thousands of these around the country. So they are mostly small, local savings and loan associations that focus on providing savings accounts and checking accounts. The deposits are insured and making mortgage loans. So that's what they did. And in the United States, I think we're pretty unusual. Our mortgage loans are 30 years at a fixed rate. So this protects the homeowner, the borrower, from any interest rate hikes. Their mortgage is going to be fixed. But of course, there is the danger to the savings and loan that if the Fed goes crazy and really raises rates, they can get into trouble. Now, if we go back to the 1970s, the thrift business wasn't very risky because the Fed didn't raise rates that much. And so it was described as 363. You pay 3% on deposits, you charge 6% on the mortgage loans, and you hit the golf course at 3 p.m. That's the life of someone who owns a savings and loan. It's very simple. They never failed, and homeowners never defaulted on their mortgages. It was absolutely safe, okay? But then in the early 70s, we started deregulating them. The original thrifts were mostly actually owned by the depositors. The depositors actually had shares, not technically deposits. They had shares in the savings and loan. The saving loan was operated in the interest of the depositors. They were the owners. In 1974, we started relaxing the rules on ownership until eventually one person could own a thrift. And that's when the drug runners, the mafia, all moved in and bought thrifts, which is a whole nother story. That's Bill Black's story. Best way to rob a bank is to own one. So that was part of the problem in the savings and loan crisis, but also even the ones that were not run by crooks. When Volcker raised the interest rate to 20%, think about this, so they are holding 30-year mortgages that earn six, and the interest rate is 20. That's the Fed funds rate, so that's the very short-term safest interest rate out there. They are in big trouble. Their cost of funds at least in theory, is going to be 20, and they're earning six. You can't stay in business very long. Suddenly, their assets are essentially worthless. Now, back then, they always held the mortgages, so they weren't selling them anyway. They're stuck for 30 years with these low-earning assets. When that happened, the supervisors, so these are the government supervisors, went around the country telling them, what on earth are we going to do? 
they said, well, make lots of new loans <laughs> at the new higher rates. And so some thrifts did that and they were growing at like a thousand percent per year, making every kind of crazy loan they possibly could make to try to grow really fast to have enough assets that potentially could earn enough to make up for all the low earning mortgages they were stuck with. And that's what blew the thrifts up. So it was raising the interest rates that then encouraged extremely risky lending that blew them up. I bring this up because while I was trying to find out more about thrifts, I ran across Wikipedia's entry on banking and pretty near the top of their overview of what a bank is, it says, quote, most countries have institutionalized a system known as fractional reserve banking. And when you click into that, it reads, fractional reserve banking is a system of banking operating in almost all countries worldwide under which banks that take deposits from the public are required to hold a proportion of their deposit liabilities in liquid assets as a reserve and are at liberty to lend the remainder to borrowers. So in spite of this being refuted by many, if not all, mainstream sources, the fractional reserve banking myth is, still seems to need debunking. Could you just clear that up for us? Well, yeah, I mean, it, of course, it's illogical because the depositors can't create funds. So there, there's no way that the source of funding for banks comes from depositors because the depositors' deposits are the liabilities of the banks. They've got to come from the banks. Banks have to issue their liabilities to the depositors. So the causation has to go the other way around. There's a bit of truth in there, which is banks do need some liquid assets. So that's on the other side of their balance sheet. Deposits for the bank are what they owe, and they need some liquid assets in order to be able to cover withdrawals. Because when you have a deposit at your bank, that's the bank's liability, but the bank is promising you that you can withdraw cash or that you can make payments, which then lead to your bank losing reserves to some other bank. That's how most deposits leave. We've been talking about bank runs. And I said, I mean, in general, I was talking about the bank runs that led to Silicon Valley Bank's failure. And a lot of people probably have the Jimmy Stewart <laughs> film in their head where it's depositors running there trying to get cash out. Modern runs don't occur that way. What people were doing was moving deposits to banks they thought were safer. So it's moving deposits to another bank. And then SVB has to come up with the reserves to cover that movement of deposits. That's why they need the liquid assets. So that part of the story was right. The other part's not. So, I mean, yeah, bringing it to the Silicon Valley Bank collapse, in your piece with uh, Yeva, you note that the Silicon Valley Bank did make mistakes, I guess, on, on their asset side, right? And I know the dust still settling at the time of recording, but what would you say those mistakes were with the information we've got at this point? Well, the mistake was listening to the Fed. The Fed, if you go back one year ago, the Fed was projecting inflation would be 3% and the interest rate would be 2% right now. That's the Fed's projection. If you took the Fed seriously, you are now dead. <laughs> so... I don't know if the management of SBV was paying attention to the Fed, but it's a bit funny now to blame them for taking on all the mortgage-backed securities and government bonds that would be perfectly fine. If the interest rate was 2% and inflation was 3% now, all of those are perfectly fine assets for going ahead and holding those when even the Fed believed that we would be at 2% and 3% right now, <laughs> okay? So they didn't make a mistake any different from the Fed's mistake at that time. It's just that now they are the ones who are stuck holding the assets. Now, I think they did make some mistakes, but the fault here is the Fed. <laughs> the fault is not banks that decided to buy perfectly safe assets. I think in our conversation with Warren, I think he had it the other way around, if I remember it, Christian, that there was this idea that these institutions should have tested their assets for potential changes in the interest rate. 
and that the Fed wasn't acting outside of those expected tests. Is there any truth to that? So there was a change in the regulations that allowed banks like SBV, as they got bigger and bigger, to escape extra supervision that was put in place after the global financial crisis. So the bigger banks are more risky for the system. So they're systemically important. Bill Black says they are systemically dangerous institutions. They are SDIs. And that the ceiling used to be $50 billion, but they raised it to $250. So that SDV could grow up close to that and escape the extra supervision. But the Fed isn't even stress testing on interest rates, the systemically dangerous banks, the big ones. So the Fed isn't doing it even on the big ones. There's no reason to believe that these smaller banks should have been doing it on their own. The Fed isn't testing even the big banks. The Fed apparently didn't believe that raising interest rates was in the cards, or if it was in the cards, that it was going to hurt the banks. So again, I think that this is a failure of the supervisors not to force a relatively big bank to do this kind of testing. Now, should the management have taken it on themselves? I think in the paper with Yeva, we said, you're always going to find errors. When you do a post-mortem, why did a bank fail? You're going to find a bunch of errors, but you shouldn't lose sight of the major mistake which is the Fed, raising rates so quickly and by so much. So the low estimate is that the long-term bonds and mortgage-backed securities have fallen by 620-something billion dollars of value. But there's a couple of academic papers I haven't had a chance to read yet that say that actually it's more like $1.7 trillion. Well, even that lower figure is one-third of bank capital. The upper figure is 100% of bank capital. So it's somewhere between one-third and 100% of the banking system's capital has been wiped out by the Fed. Just while we're on this topic, Randy, would you mind just laying out why it's the case that when a central bank raises rates, the value of government bonds goes down? Well, if you are holding a bond that pays 5%, okay, and I uh, say you paid a million dollars for it. You have a million dollar bond and it pays 5%. And then the Fed raises interest rates and bonds pay 10%. Your million dollar bond is now worth $500,000 because you've got to earn the same amount of interest on that million dollars in order to compete. So the bond falls in half when the interest rate doubles. That's the problem. And the interest rates have gone up by 400 basis points. So that wipes out the value of those older bonds that were issued in a low interest rate environment. Was it always the case that mortgage-backed securities were government, what would you call it, underwritten by the government, government guaranteed? Did that happen after the crisis? We have had government guarantees on mortgages for a very long time. Not all mortgages would have had government guarantees, even if you go back to the good old days when thrifts were pretty safe. So the mortgages had to be qualifying mortgages. And there's also a, a racist history here that is really sad. So typically, it is a uh, white suburban houses would qualify. And then you have government insurance on those mortgages. Now, the whole move to securitizing mortgages, which means that you take a whole bunch of mortgages and package them together to act as the collateral underlying a security that can be sold, that got its boost after Volcker killed the thrifts. So what thrifts and banks learned was that you can't trust the Fed to keep the interest rate low they might go crazy again like Volcker did and raise rates. So you cannot hold mortgages. That's the lesson they learned. So I think in our piece, Stephanie came up with the idea, you treat borrowers like one night stands and you treat mortgages as toxic waste. You get rid of it as quick as you can. You try to sell it off onto, to some dope dumb enough to want to hold them. 
this is a difference between originate to hold and originate to sell, right? Yeah. And it turns out it's the pension funds that are dumb enough to hold. So anyway. <laughs> That's reassuring. Yeah. So you, you can have uh, lots of mortgages in there that are government guaranteed, and that will tend to increase the value of those securities. They will have a higher rating than securities that are based on mortgages that are not government guaranteed. Okay, so we still have that government insurance, but no, not all mortgages are government insured. In your article with Stephanie, because you touched on this, you include a maxim from your old teacher, Professor Hyman Minsky. The quote is, that which can be securitized will be securitized. What did he mean by that? I remember that well. Minsky went to a conference of bankers, I think in Chicago, in 1987, and he came back and wrote this short piece with that quote right at the top. And almost nobody outside banking had heard of securitization at that point. He was the first academic economist I know of who wrote about securitization. So he wrote this nice little explanation of what it is, and then he predicted that virtually everything can be securitized. And what has happened is that virtually all kinds of loans are securitized. The student loans, credit card debt, auto-related debt, and even very exotic things become securitized. And so banking and savings and loan business was fundamentally changed. You're not going to hold the loans. You're going to get rid of them as quickly as you can. And what that means is we're not so subject to the risks of the mortgages. The securities have to be rated by ratings agencies, but it turned out they were particularly incompetent at rating, which helped to create the global financial crisis. They had no experience in doing it, and they're really bad at it. But anyway, the bank or savings and loan that originates the mortgage isn't subject to that risk. And then that, of course, reduces the incentive to try to determine the riskiness of the borrower. And then if you're willing to engage in fraud, you're not only not evaluating it, you are purposely misstating uh, the risk of the mortgages that you're putting into the securities. So it leads to all kinds of incentives against doing good, what we call underwriting. That's a fundamental problem of securitization. And then finally, so the idea was you get all this stuff off your balance sheets, <laughs> but then you have banks like Silicon Valley who decided to hold those things. Their problem does not seem to be the quality of the mortgage-backed securities, but what came back to haunt them was the interest rate risk. So the interest rate, the reason why they securitized in the first place was to get rid of the interest rate risk, but it all comes back if you start buying the mortgage-backed securities, which defeated the purpose of securitizing. And you wrote in the piece with Yeva, Silicon Valley Bank's first mistake was to sell the bonds before raising equity? Yeah. So they knew they had a hole in their balance sheet, okay, because the assets had fallen in value and it was wiping out their equity. So you, as your equity declines, then the chance that the supervisors are going to step in increases. And we know the San Francisco Fed was worried about them and they issued them, I think, six warnings, red flags, things they had to correct. And they, I think they corrected none of them. But as your perceived equity goes down, it's very hard to measure equity and uh, different ways of doing it. But as that declines, the chances the supervisors are going to step in and take over increases. So they wanted to raise more capital, which is a perfectly reasonable thing to do. But they sold bonds that had fallen in value first, which means they had to recognize a loss. And so the markets are watching that and they say, uh-oh, this bank is going to be in trouble. And then they tried to sell the equity and Goldman Sachs couldn't sell it. So they should have done it the reverse way, get the equity, and then you can afford to take the loss. They took the loss first. So that was a mistake of judgment of either the bank or Goldman Sachs, one or the other, or both. They should have gone the other way around. So in terms of where we go from here, Randy, you round off both of your recent articles with some proposals. Tell us about those. Okay, well, one, and this was Stephanie's idea, that's instead of insuring deposits, insure the banks, okay? So FDIC insured bank 
would have all deposits insured. Okay, so we've done that right now as an emergency behavior. The Fed and Treasury have announced that even the uninsured deposits will be guaranteed by FDIC. But that's an emergency behavior. So SVB stood out as having something like 90% or more, I think maybe more like 98% of their deposits were too large to have FDIC insurance. That makes it a prime target for a run. But there's a huge number of banks that have over 50% of their deposits are uninsured. So they also are good candidates for runs. There's lots and lots of them. And short sellers might start picking them off. A short seller doesn't need them to fail or anything like that. All they need is for their stocks to collapse. And we have a lot of banks whose stocks are collapsing. So anyway, it's not likely that we will continue to insure all deposits. But what we ought to do is to have a segment of banks that are FDIC insured and their deposits will be insured. And then we could have a segment of banks that will offer uninsured deposits and depositors will take their risk. So that's one way of going about it. We touched on this last time, the idea of public banking. Let's have a robust, boring public bank and that you could do it in the US through the postal system. You could certainly do it through the postal system in the UK as well. But, you know, I often think of that idea as like the way we talk about the MMT job guarantee kind of standardizes jobs. No employer now in the whole economy in the public or private sector can go below this standard in terms of pay and conditions if you implement a job guarantee. I, I was thinking that a solid safe boring public bank would be like the bank guarantee it would be it would do the same thing for uh, banks as the job guarantee would do for jobs this is like we're putting a floor under the minimum standards that you can expect from a bank actually at willamette university we're having a three-day conference that starts tomorrow on public banks and that there's a growing movement for these for public banks for state banks and an alternative to the private for-profit banking system that leaves far too many people out. We call them unbanked. They don't have bank deposits, which means they've got to use pawn shops and these check cashing outlets that charge very high interest rates on loans and high fees to cash checks. So I think we do need a public option. And in the case of the United States, the easiest way to do it is to go back to the Postal Savings Bank but Hyman Minsky had a proposal for a system of community development banks that would provide a full range of services, and they would be more of a public-private partnership with representatives of government sitting on the boards and making sure that they serve the community's interests. So that's another possible alternative way to do it. In the paper with Stephanie, our main recommendation is to stabilize interest rates. So take the discretion away from the Fed, let's mandate the Fed to stabilize interest rates, and let's move inflation and unemployment and economic growth all back to its proper place, which is fiscal policy, and use fiscal policy to manage aggregate demand and to do things like the job guarantee as our main demand management and in unemployment fighting and inflation fighting policy. The job guarantee is suited to tackle all those three while interest rate policy is not at all for any of them. And I'll just underscore that the MMT policy proposal is the job guarantee. And I'll link to our episodes laying out how it works in more detail. We've had long conversations with Pavlina Cheneva, who's done a lot of work on it as well. So before we go, Randy, we're recording this two days before your latest book, Money for Beginners, an Illustrated Guide, is about to become available through all good bookstores. Tell us about that book. Okay, well, it's a cartoon book, and it's sort of a companion to the book that just came out we talked about last time, but it's aimed at a younger audience or an audience that learns better with pictures instead of words. So it covers many of the same themes, but it lets the pictures do lots of the talking instead of words. So it's an MMT graphic novel. 
except that it's describing the way things really work. <laughs> so there's no fiction, there's no fantasy, no magical thinking. It's just explaining how money really works at a very basic level, starting really with what is money, where does it come from, can we have too much of it, all of those kinds of questions are taken up in the book. And then finally, it concludes with policy and how we can use money to improve our lives. I think more books like that is exactly what we need. And because you're too humble, Randy, I'll just add that Professor James Galbraith calls this book brilliant. And Professor Steve Keen says it contains more wisdom on money than all the textbooks in the world. So praise indeed. We'll link to where you can get a hold of that book and also to where you can get Professor Ray's other recent book called Making Money Work for Us, which we talked about last time, which I have to say is a must read in our show notes, along with a link to where you can get free tickets to the book launch of MMT Key Insights Leading Thinkers, which Randy also has a chapter in. That'll take place in London on the 20th of April. Me and Patricia will be there. We hope to see you there. But for now, thanks so much for joining us once again today on the MMT podcast, Professor L. Randall Ray. Okay, thanks a lot. That was the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Don't forget, you can support the show through Patreon, starting at a dollar a month, and get access to patron-only episodes. You can do that by going to patreon.com slash MMT Podcast. You can also find me on Twitter at MMT Podcast, and you can find Patricia on Twitter at Patricia N. Pino. And you can email us at mmtpodcast at outlook.com. Thanks for listening, and we hope to hear from you.